Um, and I'm going to let uh, Cheryl, if she wants to introduce herself and maybe what we're going to be doing tonight. I appreciate her coming um, and joining us uh, in this way. I'd rather do it in person, but it's, it's where we are today. But uh, Cheryl's very knowledgeable. She's been very helpful to me and um, through some of the things that we're, we've been going through. Uh, and she's been lined up through this time of uh, that we've been separated, a lot of virtual kind of things. It's been very, very helpful. So I hope this, I think this will be very helpful for us tonight. And I don't think she would mind if you have any questions or anything as we go through, just feel free to ask those and contribute any way, um, way possible. So Cheryl, I'll turn it over to you tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, as Mike shared, I'm Cheryl Marklin. I'm the Childhood Ministry Consultant for the Baptist State Convention. Um, I've been at the convention about seven and a half years, but I was on staff at two different churches for about 17 years before I did that and was a longtime volunteer before that. So since I was in my probably teens, I've worked with children in some way, shape or form. I tell people my first paid position in the church was the church janitor. And so I have, I know about it all. I've done it all at some point. Um, except maybe lead music. I've done everything else at some point in time. So, but I thank y'all for, for the invitation to be here tonight. As I shared with some of you, this is my first attempt at doing an online training. Um, I've done a lot of, led a lot of Zoom meetings, but this is the kind of thing I would normally do in person. And so we're going to learn together. Um, and you know that if you work with kids, you have to be, um, able to to kind of navigate move on the fly you're going to get interrupted and so if you have an issue with that then you just might as well go to like senior adult ministry or something because you're not you're going to be miserable so please know that if you have questions just interrupt me it is fine it's not going to bother me um if i know the answer i'm glad to share it if not i'm glad to tell you that too and if i need to i'll i'll research and find an answer for you but again, I thank you. I thank Mike for the invitation, and I look forward to uh, what we're going to do tonight. Um, I wasn't quite sure who was going to show up, and so this is just this is sort of a basic uh, teaching conference that's applicable to any age or any group that you might teach, and um, and I hope that it's going to be helpful for y'all um, as we regather and maybe even as you do some online training or online teaching with the kids in your ministry. So um, as I don't know if y'all can hear, I hear my husband mowing the yard. I'm hoping you guys <laughs> aren't hearing it. If you are, he's going to be finished soon. Um, but it's cool. It's, the cl it's cloudy here and cool. And so it was just a good time to mow the yard. But he'll be finished soon. But uh, as we get ready to start, I would love to open us up in prayer. Father God, I thank you. Um, I thank you for these folks who love you and who love children and who great desire is for children to know and follow you, to be your disciple. We pray, God, that what is said and done tonight will bring glory and honor to you and great benefit uh, to these leaders, knowing that they will impact children who um, are part of generations of people to come. And uh, I thank you, God. I thank you for the honor of teaching children. And pray, Lord, that you would just bless us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to try to pull up a... Uh, I need screen share, Mike. If I can, please. But we're going to be talking tonight about uh, teaching for transformation. And... Um, Let's see. You got it? And we know that with children, sometimes you have downtime. This is where you sing Jesus loves me or do something or say the books of the Bible or do something creative, which I hadn't planned to do. We're <laughs> I tell you what, we'll go ahead and start. The first question I'm going to ask you. Hey, is, hey Cheryl. Yeah. You should see um, screen share down at the bottom. Yeah, it's just, it says the host is disabled screen sharing. Uh, okay. 
How'd I, how'd I fix that? I can hear it. I didn't mean to. No, that's fine. Okay, how about now? Yay! Okay. All righty. Come on, puppy. There we go. And I've got to get my changer, so we're gonna, it's going to be interesting for everybody. Um, Jeremiah 17, 7 through 8 says, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. To me, this is a lot like children's ministry. It's like the kids are the acorns. And we know that, in, that our desire is for them to develop strong roots in Christ, that they grow to be mighty trees that produce more acorn, more fruit, more uh, people for the kingdom of God. And so, and that is our role is to foster and to take care of those little acorns, those little nuts. Some, some of them come in and you would say, yes, they're my little nuts. And so, but how do we do that um, in a way that is most effective? And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, one of the things that God has brought to my attention in the last two years is just the word why. You know, as a children's minister, a children's ministry leader, it, even as a Sunday school teacher, often we can get caught up in the mechanics of what we're doing, planning activities, figuring out how to tell the story. Um, for children's ministry leaders, it's planning events, making sure you have enough volunteers, and all those things are important. But we have to look at the big picture. We have to make sure we have a strong sense of why. And so if somebody asked you, why are you a teacher or leader in children's ministry? What would you say? Why, why are you doing what you do? <laughs> Have you ever thought about it? I think it's hoping to provide a foundation for them. I mean, even though it's with the uh, little kids, two, three, and that age, it's amazing what they soak up and how much they retain um, from day to day. So we're hope at the level that we're at, we're kind of preparing them and you know, then what their parents are teaching at home and then as they progress on up, um, my hope is uh, that we can just lay, that I'm laying a good foundation yeah. and making it fun. Yeah, I used to You got to be quick at this age. Yes, you do. My <laughs> husband taught two-year-olds for 15 years, and then he would, we had a one, and he would teach the three-year-olds he'd had the year before. And, you know, his goal, his desire was for them to, you know, have those foundational truths, some of those, the foundation that Jesus loves them. I said, I, if they left preschool knowing that um, God created them in the world, Jesus loved them, and church was a good place to be, that we had done a lot. We had laid a great foundation. And so it is so important for us to know why we're doing what we do. Um, Mike is part of a, a class that I'm teaching on Mondays and Wednesdays, Mondays and Tuesday nights, and um, we ha we had a great discussion around why, because often when you get tired, or like now when you don't know quite how to do maybe the ministry you have you feel called to do, it's the why that keeps you going. So that why, that strong sense of why, is crucial. Now, one of the reasons why you do what you do is you want to see transform lives. You want to see children um, not only come to Christ, but become a disciple of Christ. Transformation is a result of disciple making. Now, how would you define disciple making? How would you define disciple making? That's what we're called to do. Even as we teach CIA and infants and twos and preschoolers and 
third and fourth grade, we're called to make disciples. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? What does that mean to you? To grow children to the point, I guess, where they want to go out and talk about God and Jesus and their church and things they're doing in their church to their friends and maybe other people that don't have a church that mm -hmm. families don't talk about God. So it's kind of getting them comfortable with, you know, this is something cool. This is, you know, this is fun and taking it to their friends and other families. Yeah. That, that evangelism, that outreach, that's a big mm -hmm. part of disciple making. How else would you define disciple making? I think also to realize that, you know, children have, have a spiritual gift of, some sort and for mm -hmm. them to you know learn how to use no to first of all i guess determine what that gift is and then you know how can they as we're teaching them and laying the foundations but also to help them to learn how they can use that gift if it's teaching or service or whatever it might be that um they can they can learn to use that 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 gift uh, i never had thought about that before um but it that seems to be important that children do have a gift or they will have in the days to come yeah i know if you're like me and you love children's ministry you get frustrated when people say children are the church of tomorrow children are the church of today if children aren't the church of today they won't be the church of tomorrow this is where they learn to be the church of tomorrow. But we think about how did Jesus disciple that ragtag bunch of 12 that he brought near him? What are some things he did to disciple them? He taught by example. Yeah. He was a clear example. Yeah. And he, he loved them uh, no matter what, even when they made mistakes. Mm -hmm. I think for me starting out young working with youth and i'm telling a little bit of my age um because i've been in the church here in zebulon now 33 years and um have been involved in some type of ministry and you know i can name a couple of youth but uh one example i think most maybe not would be uh Travis Pace, who got up and shared his testimony um, in the pulpit just a few weeks ago. And then also uh, David Massey, whom I had as a youth and now, you know, worked in our church as a youth minister and all, to know that those seeds that were planted early on finally see the fruit coming from a lot of those seeds yeah um and you know they they were kids um but their parents the key to all that their parents had them there and had them in church and mm -hmm. you know even when ways or paths they go down maybe a wrong path or a different path um to see those kids you know come around and and really give their life to Jesus makes a big difference. And we're seeing that in, I think, a lot of our ministries. Uh, we're seeing those younger kids make, want to commit to Jesus and want to um, want to love him. Well, you know, a big part of the way Jesus made disciples was he just spent time with them. And you talked about when, you know, when they messed up, he, instead of punishing them he used it as an opportunity to teach and that's when that discipline has its true word which is disciple as he corrected them he taught them and that's part of that disciple making process he, you know he gave them assignments he sent them out to do the work and then they came back and kind of talked about what they had done again he taught as as they went out as he he as he demonstrated what to do, as he gave them instruction, and as they went out and did it, it was like all these steps in disciple making. And then they came back and they sort of unpacked it. And they could learn that way. They learned by doing. 
Now, what if you transformed your ministry from teaching to disciple making? I tell people when I was a kid, I went to a really small church and every August or September, you would get this list. It was like a ballot supposed to be. And it had like a uh, two-year-old teacher. It had first grade teacher, fourth grade teacher, 10th grade teacher. And you were supposed to vote. I thought, yeah, like somebody's gonna vote for somebody not to be the 10th grade teacher. But what if it has, instead of saying, you are going to be the two-year-old teacher, or the fourth grade teacher, it said you are the two-year-old disciple maker or the two-year-old uh, fourth grade disciple maker. How would that impact your work? How would that change how you see what you do? How would that change your why? So I think for me, that distinction is important because I don't view teaching as one of my spiritual gifts. But I think that I love children and I love seeing children learn about Jesus and teaching children how to love others, which was one of the main ways that I felt like Jesus worked with his disciples was teaching them how to love other people. So for me to change the wording takes the pressure off feeling like I'm having to teach kids because I'm not a great teacher. Um, but I do feel like I have a gift of being able to help Got, kind of guide kids to showing them how to love other people. Um, yeah, the foundation of Jesus' disciple making was relationship. And it sounds like that's your heart is the relationship. You know, and if you think back to when you were a kid in school or in Sunday school, how often do you remember individual lessons and in the way they were presented? Chances are what you remember is how people made you feel that you felt welcome, that you felt encouraged, that you felt like you belonged. And that's a key part of that disciple making. You have to do, you have to capture people's hearts before you can capture their heads. And so that's crucial to that disciple making process. Does anybody else want to comment on this this point? All right. Disciple making involves becoming a student of your class. I want you to think about the kids that you teach. What are some of the characteristics and needs of the children that you teach? What are some of the characteristics, first of all? Is Buck Wild a characteristic? <laughs> <laughs> It sure can. <laughs> you know, Wednesday nights. I mean, there is a special, special start for your crown if you teach on Wednesday nights. After, especially after they've been in school and been, mm. been contained all day, and then they come in and all they want to do is be wild. You know, and that. Well, we're going to go into the discipline part, but uh, one of the things I talk about is that kids. I think we all have this much self control as the day starts, and for kids. By the time they get to you on Wednesday night, that cup's pretty empty. And so this is, and, and they're tired. Some of them are hungry. Some of them have got to go home and still do homework or get baths. And they move to keep from falling over. And so that buck wild characteristic, <laughs> sometimes it's, it's true. I mean, because you're like, you see them on Sunday morning and you see them on Wednesday night and you're like, you know, what possessed you between Sunday morning and Wednesday night? because it, they're just, they're different kids. And you almost have to plan with that in mind. You have to teach with that in mind. <laughs> what are some other characteristics of the kids that you teach? Oh, you're scaring me. I've been carrying him and he hasn't hurt anyone. Are you a scientist? As a matter of fact, I am a teacher. Somebody else? Oh, I love it. The science of smiling. I was gonna say high energy, but that's kind of buck wild. <laughs> Um, yeah, and a, a lot of the kids in our age group, I think, you know, they're anxious to learn and want to learn, and, you know, when you sit down and do some kind of fun activity or craft, you know, they, they become focused, so I would say focused. I tell you, I'm going to ask you, if you're not talking to mute yourself, 
and then just kind of unmute yourself when it's when you got something you want to say. That'll help us all. What about some of the some of you who teach on Sunday morning? What are the characteristics and the need of the kids that you teach? Well, with them being so young, you have lots of different personalities, and you have to really figure out how you can reach them with their personality because we have some that are shy and some that are not as shy and um so that's um that's a way to kind of get to know them and get to you know how, how you can get to get over to them what you want them to know by using their personalities that is so true that's why it's like because you have disciple making it's like teaching you have to be a student too. You have to be a student of your class. And watch some of their needs. Dude. It may just be attention because they have two or three other brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah, and if you've got older kids, they may just need somebody to talk to. They may not have anybody who really listens to them. If parents are really busy, and they come home and they get on their phones or their computers or TV or just the, what you have to do when you get home at the end of the day. They just may need somebody just to listen to them tell their story. Or in my case, in the, in, you know, in the nursery, a lot of times they just want love. They just want to be held and snuggled. Yeah. Which is fine well, with me. <laughs> And, see, and that is so crucial. I tell people, think about what's the foundation of faith? The foundation of faith is trust. And those early preschool years, you're teaching them to trust, trust you and trust that the church is going to take care of them mm -hmm. and love them. Because in essence, you are Christ to them. They can't see Christ. They can't see Jesus. They can't see God, but they see you. And you function as the hand and heart of Christ to this age group and so you're building that trust with them just how you love them how you take care of them just their basic needs now if i were going to make a list these are some of the things i would have on it with characteristics and needs first of all and i didn't put this because i didn't want to open the answer so you may have to write these down they're literal learners they that abstract ability to think abstractly happens, um, begins happening in middle school. For some kids, it's even mm -hmm. high school. And when I say that they are literal learners, that means they see what you say. For those of you who um, have talked with preschoolers, some of the funniest things you'll hear is when you ask them a question and they, they answer you with what you said, even though it's not what you meant. Um, I remember when um, my nephew was three, my mother said something about he was a Richard Petty fan. And his first response was to look up at the ceiling fan because that's what a fan meant to him. And you probably all have stories of um, times when children took you literally. Um, I tell people, you know, we have church language and what, you know, we sing about being washed in the blood and okay. giving your heart to Jesus. Make a picture of that because that's what a preschooler or a younger child is going to do. And so we need to be conscious of the words that we use, the terms that we use so that it's, even though it's natural to us and we know what it means, it may not translate to um, something that a literal learner can understand. They have short attention spans. Those of you who work with preschoolers know that they're like here and there and gone again. And, and you have to plan for that. You have to plan multiple things for them to do because they have short attention spans. They say on average you can plan for about one minute per year of age plus one or two minutes. If it's something they're really engaged with, they'll stay longer. But if we plan to have group time for, for second graders and plan for it to last 20 or 30 minutes, mm -hmm. everybody's going to be pretty miserable by the end of that 20 minutes because we have failed to take into account their, the length of their attention span. 
Now they may stay with you for 20 minutes, but that means that you're going to uh, tell a story, sing a song, do a game. You're going to mix it up so that the each particular section of that presentation is going to be two to three minutes. And so you need to plan that way. If you think you're going to sit there and talk to them for 20 minutes, everybody's going to be pretty miserable. Um, we need to take into account their preferred learning styles. Now we all have a learning style preference. And the best way I know to describe this is to use a GPS. Now, unfortunately, if I keep teaching this, I'm gonna have to change my picture because everybody now uses Google Maps and stuff. And so GPSs are not like they, you, they're not as popular as they used to be. They are for me because I can see them at a distance. The screen's big enough, I can see it at a distance without my glasses on. But if somebody asks you, if you use the GPS, if you prefer the map, you like looking at the map. You can tell where to go by looking at that. Raise your hand. Chances are, if you like the map function, your preferred learning style is probably your visual. You like to see things. You like maps, pictures, timelines. You like written instructions. Um, if you have children who are visual learners, Visual clutter is a distraction. So you need to look at your room. Sometimes if you have too much stuff in the room on the walls or just uh, boxes of, for storage and all this kind of stuff, it becomes an impediment to them learning because they're busy looking at everything around the room. Now, how many of you like the little lady who says at the next um, intersection, turn right? So she usually has a little English voice. <laughs> Yes. Chances are you, you are a uh, verbal learner. You like to hear things. You like verbal instructions. You like lecture. You like a story told well. Um, the interesting thing about verbal learners though, is if you are not that, that's not your preferred learning style as a teacher, they can drive you crazy. Because not only do they want to hear what you've got to say, they need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And as they talk about it, they rehear it. And it's almost like reinforcement. So these are the kids that will ask you a hundred questions about stuff that you've already said, but that's the way they, they imprint that information in their brain. Now, how many of you prefer the little purple line that tells you where to go? And you can just feel your body following that purple line. That would be me. Of course, sometimes I, I argue with the purple line and it's going this way and I'm going this way and I have to go up and turn around and try something else. That's when it goes recalculating. Chances are, if you like that, you are, have, uh, are more of a kinesthetic learner. You like to learn through activity. You like to learn through doing it. And so even as you give instructions, you may ask a child to act out what it is you want them to do. They like drama. They like building models. Um, they're the ones who, who really love blocks. And you can use those blocks to teach, uh, to retell the story. <clears throat> so you need to take into account their preferred learning styles. Um, you need to offer experiential and sensory-based teaching. They, children learn best through doing. We know that. And when we just sit and talk to them, um, sometimes that's not, they're, what you want them to take away is not what they're going to take away. We need to let them experience what it is you are teaching. Um, they need belonging and acceptance. Um, there are kids, chances are in your class, there are kids whose lives are pretty miserable outside of what you see on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. They may be bullied. They may not be in a loving um, relationship at home. There may be uh, a job loss or other strains going on in the family. And what they need for your classroom to be is a safe place. They need to know they belong, that somebody's glad they're there and that they are accepted for who they are. Um, I tell people, I think one of the, it's, it's sad, but at the same point, it's beautiful if your class is a sanctuary for some of these kids. 
your class may be their sanctuary. It may be the only place all week where they feel loved and appreciated for who they are. And we need to remember that and how we teach, um, how we care, how we discipline, um, our tone of voice, all of that plays into helping that some child in your class feel like they belong in this world. We need to give them the opportunity to solve problems. Um, they talk about kids today and parents being helicopter parents. And I've even heard that it's, it's more from being a helicopter parent to being a snowplow parent. Who knows what a snowplow parent is? I've heard that one. A snowplow parent is somebody who goes ahead of your kids, moving all obstacles out of the way. But what happens then when they're 18 years old, they've never learned to handle their own problems. The, um, there are people, you know, you read these anecdotal stories about um, people right out of college going to a job interview and their parents going with them. Hmm. Or them having to call their mom or dad to, you know, how do I do laundry? Or their parents calling a college professor because they got a C or a D in a class because they've never been taught how to solve their own problems. And this is a huge part of growing up. And so they say as teachers, we need to offer one step above where they currently are in what we expect them to do and expect them to experience. And by offering something one step ahead of where they are, they have to learn to move their own self forward. And so that, you know, again, your class can be a place where those problem solving skills are developed. Um, they need a sense of competency and accomplishment that kind of goes hand in hand with that problem solving. When they solve that problem for themselves, they develop a sense of competence and a sense that I can do this. They need role models and relationships. And one of the things I always strive, strive to do or stroke whatever the word is, um, as a children's ministry leader, I wasn't able to always do this, but I, my goal was to have a man in every Sunday school classroom. And it's not that I don't appreciate women. I know that the bulk of children's ministry happens because of women, but there are some boys in your class who need a positive male role model who is also a Christian. Because if we're not careful, we can teach boys that Christianity is a girl's thing. And so, and, and you will find too, especially if you have a class with um, a lot of boys, when you bring a man into the mix, it changes their behavior. Um, there's a story of a herd of young uh, bull elephants that all the males, had, the adult males had been killed for their ivory. And these young bulls were going in and terrorizing villages, just tearing them all up. Well, what they found to fix the problem was to bring in some adult bull elephants. And they kind of shaped these, the younger elephants back into, into line. They were able to control them and probably save their lives. And so they need these role models and they need relationships with men in their lives. You know, some of these girls need to see how a man should treat a female with respect, with care, uh, with consideration. Because again, we don't always know what their life is like through the rest of the week. And they need opportunity to have faith conversations. You know, I tell people, I'm, I'm 63, I'll be, and when I grew up, you didn't talk about how much money you made, you didn't talk about politics, and you didn't talk about sex, and you didn't talk about religion. You just didn't. And so for somebody to have those kind of conversations, especially if you're my age, it feels a little unnatural to have a faith conversation. And yet kids, kids haven't learned that yet. They are open. One of my great joys in, as a children's ministry leader was to see some kid, and, and one of you, y'all expressed it, when the light goes on for them, mm -hmm. when God becomes real, when God, when what they read in the Bible 
makes sense to their own personal life. But a lot of that happens when we have those faith conversations, when we set ourselves up, when we have developed a relationship that they feel comfortable having those kind of faith conversations. That's just what Jesus did with the disciples. You know, it took him some time, I'm sure. You know, first of all, they had to, to really come to believe that he was Jesus, the Son of God. You know, that wasn't just something instantaneous. It took time. It took relationship. It took um, teaching and reinforcing before they could come to that belief. And it's just like that with the kids in our ministry. It takes time. It takes relationship. It takes them seeing Christ in you, Christ being real to you. You model that for them, and it opens the door for you to have those kind of faith conversations. Do you have questions about anything we've talked about so far? All right. Now, planning to teach for transformation. I'll be honest, if we're not careful, we show up, we bring our book in, we, as a teacher, we might come in five minutes before and we open the book and figure we're going to wing it. Hmm. Uh, we've all had, I had to be honest, we've all had moments like that. If, you know, if, if you're a substitute teacher, sometimes you step into that situation, but that needs to be the rare situation. It doesn't need to be every week. And so we're going to talk about how do you plan to teach for transformation? If your why is for children to become the devoted followers of Christ who have had the transformation of knowing Christ as Savior, then we have a huge responsibility when we have just a small amount of their time to make sure that every second counts. And so that as we prepare to plan, uh, or as we plan for Sunday morning, we're going to start off with prayer. That needs to be foundational to everything that we do. And then we need to preview the next session in light of the previous session. How do they connect? Um, a lot, of, Mike, what Sunday school curriculum you guys use? Lifeway. Uh, it's the Lifeway um, Bible Studies for Life. Bible studies for Life. Mm -hmm. the, it, the beauty of that, I think, of Bible Study for Life because of the popularity of Gospel Project being a chronological study, I have seen Bible Study for Life kind of transition a little more into that vein so that you have connections from week to week to week. The beauty is make, helping those kids make those connections. You know, my hope would be that they see all these Bible stories as part of God's one big story but we have to help them make that connection by connecting last week to this week and then preparing next week in light of what I taught today. So you want to do that and you want to prepare the teaching materials. Um, you want that done ahead of time. You know, I tell people one of the issues with discipline is what happens to, uh, you may get there 15 minutes early, but what happens if in that 15 minutes you're at the counter cutting out what you should cut out on Thursday night? What are the kids doing behind you? You don't know. You don't know what they're doing. They're doing whatever they want to do. And so you need to be prepared that when you get there on Sunday morning, that all you have to do is put the stuff on the table and you're ready to go. You are free to greet parents, to greet kids, to begin to engage them in, in learning activities because you have prepared before you got there. You need to practice your presentation or your story. Um, you need to, you know, I tell people, if you think about it, when you tell the story on Sunday morning in your group time, that's like the preacher with the sermon. And I can promise you that preacher has, your preacher has spent hours preparing and chances are, if he's a good presenter, he has practiced that presentation. He knows what he's going to say and how he's going to say it before he gets up on Sunday morning. And you need to do the same thing. Because for a lot of kids, um, that story that you tell is their sermon. And you need to make it count. So you do that by practicing. That means you go in the bathroom and turn the bath water on. 
or you practice driving down the road because you feel self-conscious doing it where somebody else might hear you, then that's what you do. You know, if people look over and you're just practicing the story out loud, they're just going to think you're on your phone. They're not going to know that you are practicing your presentation for Sunday morning. And you also want to make those parent contacts, um, especially for guests. It, a growing church sees outreach as, part, as a vital part of your ministry. You're not going to assume that the paid staff is going to do that. You're going to do your best to get some type, kind of contact information and contact those parents. You know yourself, you remember uh, when your kids were little or if you have kids now, the sweetest thing you can do for me, you don't have to know my name, but if you know my kids' names and you can tell me something good that happened on Sunday, you have won my heart. And so you need to make those parent contacts. And again, you need to pray. You need to pray for the kids and the parents, the families that come your way. Now, one thing I didn't put in, in this list and I should have is when do you start planning? When do you start planning for Sunday morning? Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon or Monday. You can take the Sabbath. But you need to begin reading through your lesson on Monday night or Tuesday night so that the Holy Spirit has time to work in your heart with that material before you try attempt to teach it to children. And so it is crucial that you see yourself as, as part of the work of the Holy Spirit, as you see your heart preparation as part of the teaching that you do on Sunday morning. Now, what are some keys to transformative teaching uh, or personal engagement with the scripture? You wanna ask open-ended or situational questions. Now, when, if you work with third, fourth, or fifth grade kids and you say, uh, and you ask them a question, chances are your standard answer is going to be, yep, no, or hmm. And so how you ask the question is crucial to the response you're going to get. So ask those open-ended questions that's more than yes or no. You know, it may be a thing where you take the scripture and think of a real-life application and create a situation. What would happen if... Um, even the stories in the Bible, what would you think about Zacchaeus and the tree? What would happen if you were Zacchaeus? What would you be thinking when Jesus finally saw you and spoke to you? You know, what would you um, think if you were Jesus and you looked up and there was this little tiny man up in the tree? What would you think about him? And so those situational questions where you ask kids to enter the story, engage with the scripture as if they were one of the characters, is a great way to have conversation about the scripture. Um, you might want to ask the children to retell the story in a modern setting uh, or talk about, and, and talk about the meaning and the context of the scripture. You know, why, was, why do you think a great question to ask, especially older kids, and you know, one of you talking about working with younger youth, why do you think that um, God put this story in the Bible? That's a great conversation starter, something you have to think about. That's a great question for adults. Why do you think this story has lasted 2,000 years or 3,000 years? What, do you, what about it is significant in the life of, of a disciple of Christ? So be open and think about, uh, help kids think about the context, why or why the story's important. And if you do activities, if you do those craft things, if you play those games, they're not in there just to fill time. They're designed to be a springboard for conversation or reinforcement. Mm -hmm. now, even when I was started in children's ministry, it was just Harrison, heresy to lay a, a coloring sheet on the table. You just didn't do that because you were squelching creativity and all this other good stuff. You know, you always, you put a plain piece of paper and some markers on the table. You never used a coloring sheet. But you know, color, kids love coloring sheets. A lot of them do. But the value of a coloring sheet is when you sit there and talk about what's happening in the picture that they're coloring. Um, I can remember when my daughter was in middle school, I would take her to school in the morning and it was, she couldn't have ridden the bus and it was out of my way. 
But what I found is that we had the, our very best life conversations riding in the car together when you couldn't look each other in the eye. That's when she would open up. I would reach over and just turn the radio off. And that's where she would share life. Those were some of our best conversations because they, she didn't realize what was happening, I think. And the same thing can happen with these activities, especially with, with um, older kids and, and your middle school youth, is you use the activities as a springboard, but they're really a way for you to have opportunity for, for conversation or to reinforce some truth that you're trying to get them to take away. The same thing for service projects. You know, sometimes we plan service projects for kids, but we don't tell them why we're doing the service projects. We're just, we're doing it because it's a nice thing to do. And that's, I guess that's a good answer, but there's, it uses as an opportunity to disciple about maybe tell the Bible story. If you're, if you are um, serving in a soup kitchen, you know, Jesus said, when you feed the hungry, you fed me. And so use it as an opportunity to point back to the scripture where it's more than just doing something nice. Do you have questions about this or comments that you'd like to add? Maybe something you've experienced um, that's not on this list about ways you've helped kids personally engage with scripture. Okay. I know there, there are times when we would we um, let the children act the story out, like the story of Lydia, you know, with the cloth and all of that. Just let the kids act the story out as it's being read or something like that. But those who like to act, <laughs> anyway, that, that's, a, that's a good way to... Or, was a fun way to get some stories across, yeah. I think one of the fun things, you brought up Lydia, one of the fun things I would do, but I, I like doing research, um, because we would have a large group and then small age credit groups, but there were kids, especially those homeschool kids who parents took discipleship seriously. I could begin to tell a story, and you could just see them check out, because it's like, I've heard this story 10,000 times. I'm not listening to it one more time. And I would go in and try to find some social, archaeological, cultural information that I could add to that story. It took a sacrifice of time on my part. But if I could introduce one new bit of information that, is, that was relative to the story, but it's something they wouldn't uh, know just from reading the scripture, I could get those kids to re-engage with the story. When you talked about Lydia, one of the things that I did was research. You know, you read, Lydia was a seller of purple. What in the world is purple? And so I went and researched where purple came from. It's from the gland of a small mollusk, small shellfish. And it's such a potent dye that there are, are ancient cave drawings that the purple that, that was used to write on the walls is still brilliant purple. And so, but I could just do something like that and these kids would re-engage. So that's that thing of, of studying, being a student of the kids in my ministry. I knew what they needed and I worked to supply that to help them have, uh, to open the door for them to engage with scripture in a, in a new way. That's part of being a disciple maker. Now we're gonna talk about the teaching environment. Right now you're saying, okay, we're not in our classrooms. There's nothing I can do about it. But when you get back to your classrooms, you're gonna, the teaching environment is going to be a critical part of whether or not parents return. Um, I created this outline before COVID. And I realized as I was reviewing it, I need to underline the word clean. In the past, I would have just said the word and kept going. But through no fault of our own, one of the things that we're going to have to do as children's ministry leaders is regain the trust of parents. Um, they're going to have to feel like they can trust you to provide a safe 
um, hygienic, um, germ-free environment for their kids. And so Mike may ask you to do things you've never had to do before as far as like cleaning tables, wiping down light switches and doorknobs. Uh, one of the things I'm encouraging uh, preschool folks to do is to look at their classrooms. And I know one guy said he took out 90% of the toys in his preschool classroom because whatever the kids touch, you're gonna have to clean. And so it may be easier just to remove the bulk of the toys and equipment in your classrooms and just reintroduce the few things that you need for Sunday. Because I would not have so many things and I would only have the amount of items in the classroom that I was willing to clean when the, when the uh, service or the session was over. And so you may need to go in on your own and look at these classrooms and decide how much you're willing to clean and then figure out somewhere to store uh, what you don't need. You know, you don't want anything that's cloth. You don't want um, anything that's a social activity like a, a water table or a sandbox. Um, you know, dress up clothes, anything like that that could hold that virus, you want to remove at least temporarily from the classroom. You don't want toy boxes um, or things that, you know, just wholesale where kids can touch or breathe on a lot of different things. Uh, for your school age kids, some churches are creating personalized um, activity boxes with pencils, markers, crayons, scissors, whatever, with that child's name on them and only that child uses them. So there's, there's a whole, Mike is aware of it, I, I would think there's a whole um, resource we have on our website about preparing your, your children's ministry for post-COVID. And I would encourage all of you as teachers to go in and look at that document and decide what you need to do now to get ready for when kids, when you have the opportunity to be around kids again as a group. Um, you want adherence to your safety and security policies and protocols. Um, there, uh, again, that's a way to build trust. And I tell people, what you have to realize is that's part of your outreach ministry. If a guest comes to your church and they don't see evidence that you have uh, enforced safety and security policies, that you have two adults in the classroom, that you have a check-in system, that kids are monitored well, if, if they don't see that in place, they will go to a church that does provide it because parents, parents today parent through with a spirit of fear. Um, media has cultivated that and, and just real life has cultivated a spirit of fear and they feel like they need to protect their kids, especially when the kids are not uh, within eyesight of them. Um, your attitude is part of the teaching environment. You know, are you really glad to be there? Are you glad that your kids are there? Because how you welcome them, how you may introduce them into the classroom is part of that teaching environment. You want to provide safe equipment and toys. You want it to be visually appealing. You know, when's the last time you changed the bulletin board? Do it. If you're like me as a children's ministry leader, I took down every bulletin board I could find because I hated doing bulletin boards. But if you have them in the room, is your room visually appealing? Is the paint color pleasant, appealing? Is the, are the floors clean? If you have carpet, are there, you know, is there spilled juice or coffee on them? All those things weigh into being visually appealing especially in terms of a first impression. Um, your room needs to say that we're here to learn. That means that you get there early enough to have the classroom set up so that it is, vi again, visually appealing. Kids go, hey, we're gonna learn something here today. They're ready for me to be here. They're ready to teach me. And so you need to have your room set up and, and have it, um, done up in such a way that it, it invites kids in to learn. And then you need to have an adequate ratio of, of leaders to learners so that um, you have enough leaders in the room that the kids have somebody they can relate to personally. 
All right, do you have questions about this? Now this may be a conversation, I might be putting Mike on the spot. This might be a conversation that you have another Zoom call about where you talk about the classrooms. Mm -hmm. yeah, if yeah, you and could design a classroom, you know, things you would like to have in your classroom that aren't there. Are there things you would like to see removed? Mike, you want to weigh in on that? Um, well, the thing that uh, several of us have gone through the, um, the nursery anyway, um, and removed all the things that were cloth and things that are, are more difficult. Good. So, and we have two tubs of toys, one for one week, one for the next week. And all you have to do is take it home, Clorox it, then let it dry and put it back in. And Good. then it's ready for the next week, the week after next. And so uh, we've done that and all of our safety and security policies have just changed. So that's something we're gonna have to all revisit um, if we work with children. So we're gonna have to, uh, have to, to, to go over, go over that. And, um, probably one of, in, in our ratio, that's probably one of the things that we have to, we'll probably have to work on a little bit as well. Those, uh, but I think all the others we do, we, I, I think all the teachers have done a pretty, pretty good job with, good. with all the other, but the other things we're, you know, we're just we're just gonna have to change it because of things of the situation we're in now. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, uh, you know, the the biggest deal about affecting change is recognizing what needs to be changed, yeah. and so and bring it, and it, change can be exciting if you're moving toward um, providing a better teaching environment for kids, mm -hmm. providing an environment where parents want to leave their kids. Um, where it's visually appealing and, and um, that kids want to be there. So, you know, sometimes the biggest part of, of solving any problem is recognizing what the problem is, just calling it out. So right. I'm, I'm excited that you all have a handle on that and that right. you're taking steps to address it. Okay, here's another one. I heard um, in characteristics, what were the two characteristics? Wild as a buck and what was the other one? I was talking about their kids being so busy. So we're going to talk about your role in classroom discipline. Instead of calling it discipline, although the root word of discipline is disciple, I like calling it classroom management because often what teachers do directly impacts how kids behave. And, you know, we want to blame the kids and we want to blame their parents and maybe there's some of that there. That's valid. But we also can impact um, how kids behave, especially on those Wednesday nights, because I've heard a lot of you guys say you do CIA on Wednesday night, Children in Action. And so you get kids sometimes when they are most challenging, and we acknowledge that up front. So um, these are some of the things that you can consider um, that, like I said, where you can impact what happens in the classroom. Um, that one of the easiest things you can do is just to offer choices when possible. We talked about learning styles, and when you address the different learning styles that kids can, can naturally gravitate to their preferred, an activity that deals with their preferred learning style, chances are they're going to engage more quickly with it and to a greater, uh, a deeper level. I tell people years ago, um, I, <coughs> there was a choir camp and a bunch of churches would come together and music ministers did it and I was a children's minister and I didn't know music and so they gave me crafts but what was cool is a third of the camp after a couple of years a third of the camp would choose crafts for their afternoon breakout and, and it was it was beautiful I loved it what I would do was just I had a big room I put out nine different colored plastic tablecloths and every tablecloth had an activity. Sometimes it was leftover VBS activities. Uh, sometimes it was, um, I always had one with pipe cleaners. My son had a huge thing of Legos. And then I would have just, you know, actual craft things that you could put together. 
and I would do it for three afternoons. They would be in there for an hour and a half. And every year that I did it, I never once had to call a child down for, for misbehavior. And I had some kids from my own church that had couldn't function in the school setting. And yet I let them talk to each other. I didn't care if they sat up or laid down. Um, as long as they stayed engaged with one of the crafts. And when they got through, they could get up and move to a different craft. I just sat down in the corner and let it go. It was awesome. They had fun. I had fun. And, um, you know, one year they did the church year. And so we created Chris Mons. That was the, the activities. And so we could participate in the worship service in that way. One year we made banners. Uh, and it was just rolls of paper. But they let us put them up in the worship center. So again, the kids who were doing crafts were still part of the worship services, which is what all the other um, breakouts were doing with music-based um, activities. And so, you know, try to offer choices. You don't have to offer a ton of them, but even, especially with older kids, if you can offer two or three choices, um, that's going to be a big help when it comes down to um, that classroom management. Now, another reason I covered learning styles, we all have, we're all a combination of all the learning styles, but we tend to have one or two that we prefer. And if we're not careful as teachers, we will plan activities that we like, that match our learning style. And we fail to take into account, although it is an intentional, we fail to take into account the other learning styles. And you may leave some kids out. And so try to provide a variety uh, of um, offerings. Your attendance, your consistency in attendance is important. We've talked about the importance of building relationships. Kids need to know that you're going to be there, that you are their friend and you, you care enough to show up. Now, granted, we know there's going to be vacation weeks and illness, but try to make your, the commitment you have made a priority in your schedule that this is something important, that your presence is going to make a difference in some kid's life. Um, I know when my husband taught two-year-olds, there were some parents, some kids, that if we were not going, if we were going to be on vacation and be away, we had to tell their parents so they could prepare their kids that Mr. Kurt wasn't going to be there. Because if Mr. Kurt wasn't there, it, they were, whoever was in the classroom was not going to have a good day. And so... <laughs> They relied on Mr. Kurt being there. So your con the consistency of your attendance does matter. Um, having a consistency of expectations across the ministry areas, across Sunday morning and CIA and other ministries that you may have, this is important. Because if you've got one teacher who's really strict and one teacher who's really lenient, the kids, the kids can't figure out what they're supposed to do. And so if they, if they go into the strict classroom, with the expectation they're gonna get away with what they do with Mr. Lenia, it ain't gonna go well. And so you need some kind, have some kind of conversation about what you expect across the, the different ministries. You wanna use clear, concise language. Um, Y'all have heard this before. You can tell a kid don't run, but what if they hop, skip, or jump? <laughs> they have obeyed you, haven't they? But they still haven't done what you want. If you want them to walk or walk slowly, use that language instead of don't run. Um, have maybe three to four simply stated, simply broadly stated classroom rules about we keep our hands to ourselves or we, you know, we show respect to our friends. Something that you can point to so that if there is a, a singular misbehavior, you can say, which one of these rules have you broken? And you can have a conversation about it. Sometimes kids just do things um, impulsively that may not be what you want, but it can be just like when, when uh, Peter messed up over and over, you know, Jesus could have said, all right, you're going to time out, or he could have made him stay home and not go on the trips or, you know, whatever. That wasn't going to teach Peter anything. He had conversations with Peter and brought him along. He discipled him even when he messed up. Um, prepare the room to teach. We said your room need to be set up in a way that kids know that when they get there, this is what they're going to be learning about. They talk about in brain development that kids, um, 
kids' minds can be everywhere, but when they walk in the room and you've got the room set up, it helps them advance to organize their thoughts. So it's like giving them a heads up, hey, this is what we're gonna be talking about today. And so it helps them, you have a limited amount of time anyway, so it helps them focus more quickly on what you want them to do. The same thing, come prepared to teach, have those graphic organizers, the things that they see, again, helps their brain organize what you want them to retain. You wanna plan for movement, especially on Wednesday nights, but even on Sunday mornings, um, I know I'm bad on Zoom calls. I don't know about you guys, but I sit here and twist. My chair moves. Or mm -hmm. if I'm really working, my feet are bobbing. Um, if you're a lady, you're gonna cross, chances are when you cross your legs, there are times that you're gonna bob your foot. It's a way for you to, to relieve some of that need to move in your body, and kids have that too. So you need to plan for movement. Um, control your volume. I tell people um, it's just real interesting. I could be doing any kind of conference and people can be looking around and I can just lower my voice just like that. And people will, people will automatically look up because the volume has changed. You've lowered your voice and they want to, but they want to hear what you've got to say. So lowering the volume of your voice sometimes has a greater effect than raising your voice. So try that sometime with the kids and see if that doesn't work. I know I used to do a thing with a one, I would do a council time and the kids knew we could be talking or whatever, but I would pull my shoulders back, stand up very straight and I would take a small step forward. That was their cue, that was their signal that I was ready to teach and they would immediately quiet down. It's just, I, I tell people I really learned it from watching um, the dog whisperer. You know how he talks about you have to be the lead dog mm -hmm. and watch the lead dog, the alpha dog. He's gonna have some kind of something he does to show he's alpha. And it's like when you, you figure out your own cue, but for me, that was it, especially with boys. I stood at attention. I didn't have, I just stood, took a step forward and I did not say a word. And they automatically within 20 seconds, the room would be silent. But that's something you have to condition them to and it's something that you have to demonstrate. Um, you wanna connect with the child. They need to know that you care about them before they're gonna care what you think about what they do. And so you need to build those connections with kids and you need to connect with the father. Um, there's nothing worse, I've done this and I, chances are you have too, there's nothing worse going in at the last minute into a, a class and I have not prayed. And I, I, that day chances are is just not gonna go very well. My, those days that I have connected with the father before I, and I've heard his direction before I try to direct kids, that's the days that things go better. All right, this is a big topic. Do you have questions or situations you wanna talk about in terms of classroom management or discipline? Hmm. Mm -mm. Mike's moving, he needs to move. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, this is where I've always struggled with kids. I don't know why, um, as far as any kind of management or mm -hmm. discipline, I it's just always been difficult, you know, um, especially with a short attention span. You know, the that's I don't have a very long extension uh, attention span either, so I'm pretty much with them on that. But you know that, that I. I think for me, this would be the hardest one because I mean, you have some kids that come from homes that there are, you know, it's there, they have rules, and others, you know, that might just child does whatever they want to do at home. And, you know, I think that for me would be a hard, it's a hard battle to figure out what do you do with all of that. You know, that's, that's just been hard for me. Yeah, well, years. I think this is where you transition your thinking from being the teacher to being the disciple maker. 
we say what's the root word of discipline disciple and so um it takes time to learn to think this way uh to where you see even opportunities for discipline as an opportunity to disciple um, and this is where too if you have more kids than you have a adult leaders it gets to be more challenging and you've got school teachers and they'll manage 25 kids and do fine but it's what they do all the time and it's a skill they have learned but for most volunteers they don't have that opportunity they come in and they may have 15 kids on sunday morning for an hour and especially if you're a new teacher it's easy to get discouraged this is often where new teachers or even old teachers um, leave the responsibility, leave the call because of trying to deal with kids' behavior. Now, I'm not saying this is gonna fix all of it, but it is going to impact um, the amount of discipline issues you have in the classroom. You become a student, like I said, of your class, and you learn um, what they need. You know, some of them need a little more free reign. Some of them need choices. Some of them need opportunity. It's okay that if you take the craft material and you do something a little bit different with it, as long as it's applicable to what you're teaching, it's okay. And so it's where you see what you're doing as discipleship. Um, and in that, I think that frames everything you do in a, in a, to, to create a different picture, a different vision for children's ministry. Some of you guys that have taught for a long time, what would you say about um, what we put up here for classroom management and discipline? Who's taught the longest out of all this bunch? <laughs> Who's been teaching the longest? Hmm. Gail, what was that? 31 years? That's a long time. <laughs> I was going to say Donna. All right. Some of you guys that have taught 15 plus years, let's say 15 plus years. I think, um, well, Jane, you're right there with us. So, you know, we've got the younger ones. Yeah. And sometimes it is a challenge, um, but, uh, you know, there's one thing that um, Donna's been very good about teaching, and especially when we had different age, do what you say you're going to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make sure that they understand. And uh, we have put them in timeout uh they they're given an opportunity you know if they hit somebody they have to sit down then they have to apologize um and one of the things you know that we tell uh, have a conversation with parents too is that you know we're if we're going to discipline the kids and uh, i think that's clear you know we're going to love them but you know, everybody gets a little excited or yeah. is tired or has a bad day just in general. And um, they usually, they don't like to tell their parents either um, what's going on. So <clears throat> Donna has uh, been really good. And Donna and I have always been on the same page when it came to discipline. You, you've got to do it to maintain your classroom. And, um, you know, when boys are different than girls, and then sometimes the girls are some of the lead ringers too. So uh, <laughs> you have to do it. Yeah. And, you know, and we always, okay, come here and sit in my lap now. And let's move on. Um, and before they all leave, you know, we try to give them that hug or whatever. And Jane has the same one when the ones get in there walking and, and stuff too. You have to do it. Yeah. Well, that's part of teaching is, is knowing that there's consequences. I mean, that's part of teaching 
laying foundation, believe it or not, for sin. It's not necessarily a conversation you need to have with a two-year-old, but the fact that we mess up and we, um, that there are consequences, but that through grace we are forgiven and we go on, um, you're laying the foundation for those future conversations as you discipline well, as you disciple well. Donnell, are you going to put your two cents in? Anybody else? <laughs> like I said, another thing I should have put is just using natural consequences. Like she shared, if, if a child hits a, hits a child, you apologize. If you've told a kid to quit goofing around or they're going to spill their juice and they spill their juice, what do they do? Clean it up. They clean it up. And if they, if you've told them multiple times or this is a pattern, chances are they don't get more juice or they get water instead. And so, you know, just that natural consequence is important. You know, if you knock somebody's tower, block tower over, you help them fix it. You know, you apologize, especially if it was on purpose, and then you help them fix it. Um, but try to think about um, natural consequences also. Make sure that it's like the, the punishment fits a crime kind of thing, although you're not into punishment. Yeah, so. I, I think the big thing that, you know, we have is kind of beforehand when you're letting them play, sharing. Yeah sharing of the toys or everybody wants the same toy they have to learn how to take a turn yeah. um those are the kind of the natural ways that you know that you can teach or disciple them because they're they're always going to be those choices in life oh yeah well i know they talk about with with uh, younger preschoolers that because they're so egocentric that instead of talking about sharing, because that's a little bit foreign to them, is that you, just like you said, you, we're going to take turns. They can understand take turns because that, that still involves an element of me in, in the conversation. So, but um, we're going to get finished up here. I know if you're like me, it's getting to be a long day. But um, connecting with parents is crucial. The one thing that has that this COVID, um, quarantine has unveiled in a big ugly way is that parents were, my phone on. parents were not prepared to disciple their kids at home you know that they brought their kids to church and you did what you do and but for many parents there are some parents who do it but for many parents that discipleship at home was just a really foreign concept and even though you sent material home uh, a majority of your parents never opened your email. You know, they never joined the Zoom call. And so <clears throat> how are we going when we re-engage, re-gather with our families? This is something um, we're going to have to raise our game on this. How do we engage with parents, not only to build relationships, but to disciple them so they can disciple, they know how to, are comfortable discipling their kids at home. And so, you know, some of that's going to be that in during your greeting and release time, how do you greet them? And you're only going to be able to be free to greet them if you've done your preparation at home, if you've done that planning well at home and that release time, um, having some, some way that um, as kids are released, you're making connections with parents. Now, one thing I would add in terms of the discipline Everybody on occasion has that one kid that stays in trouble all the time. Don't hit that parent with that when they come to the door. You know, make a call later or work with Mike on having that conversation. Because um, that parent knows their kid's a handful. And the last thing they need when they walk in after they have been in worship or Sunday school is to get hit with this bucket of slime where somebody is telling them how bad their kid is. And so if you, if it's a, a perpetual behavior that is uh, limiting your teaching time in the classroom, or they are endangering themselves or other kids, then you have that conversation with the parents. But you do it, um, you make a phone call or you do a home visit. You don't embarrass them in front of other parents. And, um, you know, 
they know their kids a handful. You're not telling them anything they don't know. Don't take out your frustration with their child on them when they hit the door. And uh, to me, that's an important part. That's extending grace to that parent. Um, you can use the electronic and print media. I know that Bible Study for Life used to have a pre-written or uh, pre-made email that you could copy and paste and send. Um, use emails, text, snail mail. That's one thing everybody right now is so zoomed out, and even kids are now that school's getting ready to start back. You know, there is a huge value in sending a kid a postcard, something with their name on it. Um, they've got their own mail. It belongs to them. So consider sending snail mail. And then there's always phone calls and messages. We recognize that a lot of parents will not pick up the phone if they don't recognize the phone number. I do that too. But, you know, if you can get their number and send a text to them or you send a text to the parents, just say, hey, how's your week going? Praying for you today. Um, just a reminder, this is our memory verse for the week. Um, that just keeps them connected. And then there's apps. I was looking today, if you download free Lifeway Kids, the Lifeway Kids app, and um, get your parents to do that, and it's almost like a take-home sheet. You can pick the uh, Bible Study for Life, Summer 2020, and it'll give you all the stories in this quarter, plus some activities, parent helps, that kind of thing, and it's free. All right, any more questions? Hmm. We need to remember 3 John 1, 4 says, I can have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. And that's what we want to do. They're your children for that one hour a week. And in your heart, they're probably your children too. And there should be no greater joy in your heart than knowing that you have played a role in that child being able to follow the truth to become a disciple of Christ. All right, Mike, back to you. All right. Does, uh, does anyone uh, have anything else they would like to Talk about real quick. I know it's getting late. It's been a long day for most everybody. Um, but is there, any, is there any pressing question that you would like to uh, to ask at all or anything? I'd like to ask one more question. Out of everything you heard tonight, what's one or two things that either made you go, I need to be doing that, aha, uh -huh, or that's something I'm going to add? to what I do. Well, I think for me, I've, I've been trying uh, with, I don't know how much success, but um, to record a short children's and preschool Bible story. But number one, they've been too long and um, I heard that they like some kind of little figure. So if you haven't watched the preschool one, you'll get a <laughs> kick out of it if you haven't watched it this week. So your kid may not watch it and like it, but you, you'll you you'll have a lot of fun and with it. Uh, so uh, I'm trying anyway. Um, it's kind of way out of my league, but we'll give it a whirl. So uh, I think just thinking of mixing the activities, like even with something like that, um, with trying to just share a simple Bible story, maybe – throw in a song and a short story and maybe another song or something. So that, that was, that was just another reminder that I'm trying to mix it all up and keep their attention. Tell him in one more minute. <laughs> one more minute, Carter. One more minute, Carter. I heard you. <laughs> hey, Carter. Tell us your mic, hey. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hey, Carter. <laughs> Yo, hey. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I think I think also for us it probably um be maybe praying before too because I think sometimes the kids are so loud when first came on being on Wednesdays and 
it's just kids kind of overwhelming sometimes and we just kind of try to get started the best we can. I think sometimes probably just sitting down and making sure we do get started with a, a prayer kind of, um, that definitely gets everybody quiet and involved and probably can get things started off maybe a little bit easier than how we normally do. I know one of the things I would do when I did a one council time, they, and it's probably not comparable, as comparable to what y'all do, but as the kids came in, they were coming to the worship center, which made it a little easier because they were in pews. But I did this thing, they had to give a one word answer to a question. And sometimes it was um, your favorite ice cream flavor or hamburgers or hot dogs or just something silly, but every kid in the room got a chance to say something out loud. And it was a way to get them calmed down because they had to listen. They wanted to hear what the other kids were saying. So it was a way to get them engaged. And, you know, it was two or three minutes, but it was, um, that was sort of a fun way to get them settled in for the evening. Which is, I just called it a popcorn. And they could only give a one word answer. So you have to make sure you phrase your questions that way. Now, another thing I would do on Sunday morning, because y'all know how kids straggle in for 20 minutes. Um, I had a huge set of Legos and I would set up Legos around a table. And then the girls, there was a whiteboard and I would have whatever worship music we were going to be having in the worship time. I would have that playing so they could hear it before they went into worship. But there were just these couple of things and they always knew the Legos were gonna be there. And the kids all came from different schools. And you know, and there were the popular kids, the sporty kids, the nerdy kids. But you know, the nerdy kids really do a good job with Legos. And so they would sit and, and the girls would, some girls would join them too. But they knew that at nine o'clock they had to put the Legos up. But that was a great equalizer. And it was a great way to get them to come in and get busy doing something. I don't know how constructive it was. I probably should have been doing something that related to the lesson. But again, this was, like I said, a great equalizer. And kids who rarely talked would talk over the table of Legos. I think that's a good point, Cheryl. Um, kind of like Corey was saying, I think for us on Wednesday, one of the biggest challenges is kind of getting the focus and giving them something to do when they come in, um, I think is, is kind of key. So having something to keep them busy that isn't them running around, creating their own game, like yep. acting, you know, doing whatever, acting crazy, um, but giving them something to keep them entertained, but kind of keep them, I don't want to say seated necessarily, but something to kind of keep them calm. Wait, I feel like we start behind when we come in and they're already crazy and we're trying to corral everybody and get them focused. Whereas if we come in with a plan on give them this to entertain them until we're ready to start, that might be better. And I don't, I don't know what the adults are doing before the kids get there, but whoever gets to the room first gets control of the room. If you're there first, you get control of the room. If the kids get there first, they have control of the room and you have to wrestle it from them. So it may <laughs> be something as simple as getting there a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah. it, part of it is taking that energy level because they've probably been running outside or whatever and trying to bring that energy level down to a manageable level, that's your challenge. But, you know, helping them refocus that energy, um, it, I think is gonna be key to getting their attention faster. You know, the, I, I, would, uh, I know what Teen Kid does, I would assume CIA has some early arrival activities and get, uh, I know Teen Kid is, is not craft based at all, it's all game based because they recognize that it's supposed to be like a club setting um, and so, um, and I think CIA is kind of like that where you have those early arrival game kind of things, but, you know, go ahead and have those ready. Um, if you have, like I said, if you can have some guys there, one or two guys, that it really does make a difference, especially if it's guys that um, aren't in about, I mean, they need to be able to discipline, but they don't need to come in and be the enforcers, if that makes sense. You know, it has to be somebody who won't be run over by the kids, but who still enjoys kids. 
to make a difference. All right. Any any anything else on that for any for anyone before we before we close out tonight? I do want to thank I do want to thank Cheryl for her for her willingness to sure. give this a give this a shot. And for those of us who are guinea pigs, I think it worked out really well. And so well, um, we appreciate it very, very much, Cheryl, for your time. I mean, if, if I had to go back, I, I mean, if I'll evaluate what how this went tonight. If I, and it's just like you guys, if I went, when I go back, if I do this again, I'll add more opportunity for conversation where I'm not just talking for an hour because I know that gets, that's old when we're on Zoom, listen to a talking head. So, you know, consider that even as you plan your lesson that, you know, I should have mixed up opportunity for activity um, more. And so, you know, take that, I, I, I'm learning too. But if you have questions, things you want to discuss or, or just, you just want to know more about some topic, um, I should have included my email at cmarkland. Mike has it, cmarkland at ncbaptist.org. Mm -hmm or go to the convention website, ncbaptist.org, and click on children, and you can find me there. Right. Well, all right. Well, I appreciate everybody, um, uh, your time, um, and um, I, I appreciate you uh, uh, sticking with us. And uh, if you would, I'll just give us a, a short prayer, and then we'll end our time together, if you don't mind. Let's pray together. Oh, we just thank you for this time that you've given us. We're grateful, uh, God, for... Uh, the information that we've learned, I just pray that we'll um, take uh, take the parts that we can and um, use those to uh, to help improve our classroom setting as well as our 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 function as teachers and discipleship makers, uh, or disciple makers. And so I just just pray you'll help us to, to to be able to be more transformational in what what we do and. Uh, take our task very serious because the children are the church of today, not tomorrow. And so help us to see that as well. And just thank you for, for Cheryl, for her wisdom that she has and the years of experience that she has as well and her willingness to share with us tonight. And so I thank you for all of these other uh, participants as well tonight. I just thank you for their life and for them giving of themselves to serve uh, our children uh, and so I, I just thank you for them as well. So uh, I pray that you will be with us throughout the rest of this night and this week. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, again, thanks, everybody. And I hope you have a good rest of the week. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay.